Uh, I'm really excited about um, <clears throat> being able to bring forward literally what has been about um, two years <laughs> of being in a cave. Uh, I told y'all before, you know, before I um, launched out and started teaching, you know, I, I've been teaching in a, in a church in Detroit. I've been uh, serving as youth pastor there. I served on Ministerial Alliance. And, um, you know, the Lord had called me away, um, said it's time for me to do particular ministry. And when I left the church, I remember feeling like, well, guess it's my job to go start a church. You know, go start, go get me a build, you know, get the thing going, get the fellowship going. And it was amazing because I thank God that I didn't go off my own volition or go off my own mindset. And I just waited and just kind of waited to see what he wanted to do. And it was amazing because he kept, he started to download and give me understanding, information, uh, things that he wanted to reveal to his people uh, in this time, in this hour. So as he started to give me understanding, it was like, man, I'm keep, I keep getting more and more understanding. So I know that you're calling me to teach. What do you want me to teach? And um, it's amazing some of the things that I've learned, some of the things that I've, I've seen in the Word. Um, some of the things you're seeing today, this is not YouTube revelation. I said that last week, you know, and I'm not knocking <laughs> YouTube videos. Uh, this is studying the Word. This is having dreams about things and then ask God what the dream meant that he showed me in the Word. So this is, this is revelation. This is what I feel is illumination that he showed me. Um, there's some things that we're going to talk about today um, that is kind of hot off the press, as I would say, in relation to information. Um, and I'm excited to kind of bring it forth to the body. The first thing I really want to do, I kind of always talk about what this class is about, because I know there's some new people here. Um, but this class, again, is called the Truth Class. It's, about, it's designed to challenge the status quo of church. Status quo simply means the current state of affairs. And uh, it's interesting because when you look in the Word, when we look in the, the scriptures, we always see the prophets of God challenging the status quo of that day. Amen. So they were never happy just with what they saw. They will always see things and they'd be like, man, you know, I feel a certain way about what I see. And then the word of the Lord would come to them and they would have to declare what they saw. Amen. So one scripture I want to look at to open up is just real quick. is Luke 6 and 26. Real quick. We can just take a look at that. Can you get the light? So we can read that. <laughs> And if somebody can read that for me, that would be great. Yeah, we're looking at Luke 6 and 26. Woe, woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. But so did their fathers of the false prophets. So woe unto you. This is Christ speaking because we know it is because it's in red. <laughs> all right. So woe unto you. <laughs> When all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. That's a, I, when I was reading that one day, I just hit me like, wow. That's an amazing thing that Christ said there. So why would he say, woe unto you, when men shall speak well of you? Somebody want to, why do you think he would say that? It's simple, because when you're telling people the truth, the truth and when you're telling people the state of affairs and the, what things really are and how they really look, people are not going to like you. They're going to have a problem with that. People are going to say, I don't want to hear that. I ain't got time for that. And it's amazing, you know, when you look in the Word, when you look, especially look in the book of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and you see the things that the prophets were prophesying against, I bet you if they were saying that today, we would think they were mean. People are like, Phew. They ain't got never nothing nice to say. Yeah. You know, they always got something bad to say. But that's what God was calling them to do. So to be used of God, you have to be courageous. And you have to have courage to be able to speak the truth when you know uh, what God has showed you to say or if you know the truth in his word. Because we live in a day where people just want to be liked. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Especially with Facebook. Yeah. It's all how many likes you got. It's all about likes. It's all about shares. Thumbs up. Smiley faces. You know, they don't want to hear we're not, it doesn't even reward things that are challenging or things that are convicting. Amen? So we got to be careful when we want people to like us because, again, Christ is saying here, woe unto you. Because you have to, if you're going to follow Christ, he said, I am the way, I'm the truth. 
and the life. So if we're following Christ, that means we are following the truth, and the truth is not always popular. Amen? All right. Can you get the light? <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all this again. I told you uh, before, this is not an us versus them class. This class is not to create division. It's not to, you know, stand on one side of the fence and make everybody mad at the people on the other side. No, this class is to help the church produce more fruit, to push the church forward, to push the body of Christ forward so we can go forward in the next generations to come with the right truth so we don't continue to repeat some of the same traditions and things that we have been passing down from generation to generation. Amen? And I'm not anti-church, anti-pastor. I'm pro-kingdom, pro-fruit, and pro-truth. All right. So in the class, the methodology that we talked about when we bring forth some of the things that we're talking about is first thing I like to do in study, I always try to understand what the Bible is saying. So we try to understand what the original writer was saying in the scripture. Uh, that sounds very generic, but I'm telling you that is very serious. You know, for instance, uh, when the apostle wrote, the apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John was not passed around with a whole Bible when it first was written. Right. It was meant, it can stand alone. Okay? So when you look at the first, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And it ends saying, and many things that Jesus did, if I could say them all, I couldn't write them all in one book. Amen. That's how the book ends. Okay? So when you read the book of John, you have to take him at his word for what he's writing in that book. Now, we can use other books in the Bible to kind of get clarity on things, but when he wrote the book of John, you have to keep things in context when we study the word. And a lot of people don't do that when they read the Bible. We don't keep things in context. We don't understand who, what, when, why, and where. And if you don't do that, then what ends up happening is you can come up with uh, erroneous thoughts or you can come up with uh, things that are taken out of context, which we call proof texting. We're going to talk about this in this class. So methodology, the first thing we we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to make sure we understand what the original writer was saying and what did it actually mean when he wrote it and why did he write what he write. Okay? I told you in the previous slide, one of the things you have to understand when you read the Bible and study the Bible is it, it helps you to know some history. Okay? You know, a lot of people want to forsake history and just read the Bible and say, I don't need anything but the Bible. And as I said before, for a work of salvation, to understand what Christ taught, to understand what the apostles taught, to understand redemption, repentance, yes, you can just use the Bible and you will get it all. You can read the Bible and you, you can be saved. Amen? Right. But when we start teaching theology, teaching doctrine, saying the apostles taught certain things, that's when we got to start looking at some history. That's right. Okay? That's because right. we can say, we can go in the Word and pull up a lot of different theologies and doctrines, but then we always got to go back and check, which is number two, the history. <laughs> okay? So if you're teaching something, if your doctrine is accurate, there should be some proof histor uh, historically that it was actually followed that way. Okay? One of the things that um, the, some denominations or some churches don't do is they don't study uh, early Christian writings. And it's so important because there's so much history and so much understanding sitting there waiting for us to uncover it about what the apostles were teaching and how the early church actually conducted themselves. When I got started reading into this stuff, it was amazing the amount of understanding that came in the scripture and how the church is supposed to uh, operate. Because I truly believe if the apostles set it up a certain way, then that's the fruitful way to do it. I feel like they had the revelation. I don't feel like we needed to continue to develop and innovate. I believe they had the full counsel of God. Like Paul said, I have not declared, have, I've declared unto you the full counsel of God. Yeah. That's what he said in Acts. He told that to the elders in Acts chapter 20. So if he had the full counsel and they taught the churches what to do, then I think that's the way we should be doing it. Okay? So we're going to look at history. We're going to be able to determine whether or not people were actually doing what we're teaching historically, especially in the first, second century, which is very important. Okay? Lastly, the falling away. So if they followed it the correct way, then when did it change? When did the doctrine change? And why are we doing things a different way today? Okay, so the reason I wanted to hit that again is because, as you know, we've been talking about uh, plurality eldership and that the early church and the apostles actually set up a group of overseers to oversee assemblies. Okay, they didn't set up one man. 
They didn't set up the system we see today. They didn't set up a system with a one-man pastor. They didn't set up a system with a one-man bishop, okay? So that's what the first challenge was. We were asking the question, is the one-man pastoral bishop system biblical? I'm not going to go through all of these content because we already went over those the first couple of weeks, but just as a quick refresher, we talked about monarchical episcopy versus plurality eldership. Monarchical episcopy simply means a person that holds a dominant position. That's what monarchical means, and the church government is episcopy. So that's what that word means. So it just basically means congregation ran by one man who is the overseer or bishop of the flock, which we see a lot of today. Uh, and then when we talk about plurality eldership, it's simply called an elders council, and it means exactly what it says, a congregation ran by a group of elders who all oversee bishop the flock, okay? We talked about offices and callings, and this is very important to understand because in the word we see offices and we also see giftings and callings, okay? And we talked about offices. These are things you can become qualified for. These are physical qualifications. So when we look at the two offices in the word, we see bishops and deacons. That's the two offices that Paul classified and we see in the Philippians 1 and 1. He said, uh, to the, uh, he wrote an opening letter to the church of Philippi and he said to the bishops and deacons among you. So those were the two leaders, the bishops and the deacons. And we talked about in the class, couple, first couple weeks, the word bishop, elder, presbyter, pastor, they're all interchangeable. They all meant the same thing. We're even going to show you when we get to this historically, you're not even going to see in some of the writings, they were using them interchangeably. One minute they're saying bishop, and then they switch and say, because the presbyter. Like, they use the words interchangeable. It was an interchangeable term. But see, because we don't know that, we think these are all different functions, different offices. He's like, no, they're talking about the same thing. Okay? And when you, uh, you get that understanding, then the word of God is going to be more illuminated to you. Okay? So we talked about bishops. They have qualifications. The husband's on one wife. So you got to be the husband of one wife, not a striker, not a brawler, not greedy for filthy lucre. We talked about all these things in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Okay? Deacons also had qualifications too. These were all carnal qualifications, things you do. Okay? So, in order to become an elder, an overseer, or a bishop that oversees a church, you got to meet the qualification, number one. So, you know, you can't be a lover of money, because he said, Paul said, if they love money, they're not qualified. That's right. Okay? <laughs> so, same thing with the deacons. Then when we look at callings, we're talking about gift things. These are things you are graced to do by the Holy Spirit. These are gifts that Christ gave the church. Okay? This is not saying you, uh, callings are not what's leading though. Callings are the giftings. These are the things we're called to do. All right? So apostles are called to do this by the Spirit. Romans 1 and 1 says Paul called to be an apostle. Okay? Prophets gifted by the Spirit. Teachers gifted by the Spirit. We're not going to go through all of these. The reason we want to bring that forth is when we look at the giftings, just because you can prophesy does not mean you're qualified to lead. That's why there was still a qualification. Okay? And that's why we wanted to make sure we hammered this out because in today's church, we're all moved by charisma. Yeah, that's, right. that's what we want the most. We want charisma. We want, we want you to be able to sing the church down or, or preach the church down. And that's fine. You got to have the gift. You got to be gifted. God will call you, give you gift things to do it. But again, you have to be qualified according to the word in order to protect the church. Yeah. That's the key because those who lead are protectors. Yeah. Yeah. They're husbands. That's good. That's good. Okay? We got to protect the flock. Yeah. Amen? So that's why we want you to meet carnal qualifications. <laughs> Amen? All right, we're not going to keep going through this. So we talked about there's only two biblical leadership offices, bishops and elderly women, elect ladies, and deacons. This is the only thing in the Word that shows these are offices and they had qualifications. We know exactly what their role is, exactly what their qualification is. Okay? All right, and we talked about elders, bishop, pastors, shepherds being the same office. They were used interchangeably. And it wasn't until later that people made, made them mean something different. We're going to cover that today. We're not going to go through all of this. We went through all the words first two weeks. If you haven't seen this, there's a video. I'm going to drop it, uh, the video from the second week, uh, probably in the next couple of days. You can go through. We go through every one of these words, bishop, episcopal, episcope, every one of the words. And we prove to you that these words were interchangeable. Okay, we prove it. We go in the Word, went into the Bible, went into the lexicon, gave the definitions. We made sure it was clear. Because again, that was the first thing. We're going to look at the Bible first. Okay? Because today we're going to look at the history. All right? So, let 
So today we're going to do historical proof that the one-man pastoral or bishop system is not orthodox. So what does orthodox mean? First? Good. Yeah. What does it mean, Kennedy? <laughs> Orthodox is simply mean um, original or normal or the original tradition or the way it was set up. So when we say orthodoxy, we mean the original way of doing things. It's orthodox. Okay? So like you think about fighters, boxers. Sometimes they'll say he's an orthodox boxer because he has a normal standard way of doing it. And then they got guys that are unorthodox. And they South Pauls, and they say they're a little bit more difficult to deal with because you're not used to dealing with that because it's not traditional. Okay, so it's very similar terms when you think about it uh, biblically, it just simply means uh, what was not originally practiced. So we're going to prove today that that was not what was originally practiced. So we're going to look at a couple of writings. Um, it's very clear from early writings that the elders, council, government, and overseership was followed. So we're going to look at the Didache which was written around 50 to 100 AD. Now, just to kind of get a step back, uh, you know, according to, you know, the um, Julian calendar, we were on the Julian or Gregorian? Gregorian. Gregorian, okay. According to the Gregorian calendar, Christ was born in zero AD, okay? Because when we say AD, we mean, you know, I forgot the Latin term for it, but it means year of our Ad Lord. At his domini. At his there we go. It means the year of our Lord. So we're assuming that Christ born, was born in zero AD, and then he was crucified somewhere around, somewhere around 30, 35, 33 AD, okay? So if the Dashe was written sometime between 50 to 100 AD, that's very close to that time. Okay, and the Didache we're going to see it was just an early church manual that was found uh, included with some codexes. We're going to look at Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. We're going to talk about who that was. We're going to look at Clement, Clement of Alexandria letter, which was written in 88 to 99 AD. Now, these are real people. I don't use spurious works. Spurious means works that are contested as being fake. Okay, these are writings that people, theologians believe are legit writing, writings written by Christian believers in that time period. Okay. So, again, this is not scripture. It's the same way y'all buying books right now of Amazon. Okay? You go on Amazon, you bought some other guy's book. Okay. So, at that time, they had people that wrote, too. And they all wrote. It's funny because they were so influenced by the word. They wrote like Paul wrote. They wrote like John wrote. So, they were so influenced by these guys. Right? You're going to see that their words and the way they wrote was very similar uh, in how they did it. Amen? Hey, how you doing? And then lastly, we're going to look at Brother Teach, I got a quick question. Yes. Has any, uh, has, has any of your information come from the antiquities of Josephus or Josephus? Not in this particular study, but we're going to look at that maybe somewhere else. But that's a good, good, good question. Yeah, Josephus also wrote a history called the Jewish, the Jewish Wars, and he he chronicled a lot of things that happened in the first century. A lot of people use that because he talked about Christ in it. He talked about James. So, you know, when people start saying Jesus never existed and the apostles, that's all fake. Well, we got other writers from other people that were not believers that will vouch that these people were, in fact, alive in that era. Okay? Last thing we're going to look at is Jerome's commentary on, the, on Titus. We're going to talk about who these people are. So the first thing, the didache. Didache simply means the instruction. That's, didache is a word for instruction. It's the same word that's in the New Testament. When you see teaching or when you see instruction, when you look it up in the Greek, it's didache. Okay? So this was a manual that they found at a church. Um, basically, I'm just going to summarize it. Uh, it seems as if um, this was used for a catechism. Catechism is another word which basically means instruction. Okay? It's in the New Testament as well. When you see the word instruction, sometimes you see catecheo which means instruction. So basically, I got to break it down like this to kind of show you how the early church would run. Um, you would have evangelism, discipleship, and you also had fellowship. You had kind of three different modes working. Okay, today we just basically only used to services, right? We're used to just fellowship. But in the early church, what they did was you had those that evangelized. You know, so we see Mark was an evangelist. We see that in the New Testament. The reason Mark was an evangelist is because he knew the gospel. So the evangelist's job was to know the gospel and be able to preach the gospel. Because again, if there was no gospel written down yet, somebody had to remember this. Okay? 
Another thing about the evangelists is that they may have also had a copy of a gospel. So there was no printing press back then. <laughs> so if you had a handwritten copy of the gospel, that was very powerful. That was very, very valuable. Okay, it wasn't until much later that they got a bunch of copies of the uh, New Testament. So um, when you had a copy, you were considered, you could potentially be considered an evangelist as well because you actually had a copy of the teachings of Christ. So what they would do is you have people that go out and they would evangelize, preach the gospel, and if people receive the word, then they will go through instruction. They would teach them the teachings of Christ, okay? And what you would see is that was called kind of a preparation step for baptism, okay? So that's what they were doing in Rome. So they would prepare you, then they would baptize you, then you were essentially f fully in the fellowship, okay? So that's a little bit different than how we do it today because, you know, a lot of churches today are built around just come, come down to the altar, hear the word, and you're in. Back then, they were a little bit... A little, little bit more drawn out because they really wanted to instruct the believer or instruct the new convert in what the teaching was about, okay? So this word, this didache here, is basically a manual that was found in Palestine. It was most likely some summary text that a church had, okay? The reason we're going to look at it is because it records what they were teaching. So I'm going to just kind of show you a little bit of it today. We're going to scroll down to chapter 15, which is important. But it's interesting, like when you read the first chapter, it looks like they summed up the entire New Testament. Okay, so it says, chapter 1, there are two paths, one of life, one of death. The difference is great between the two paths. Now the path of life is this. First, you should love the Lord God who made thee. Love your neighbor as yourself and all things that thou wouldest not should be done unto thee. Do, it, do not thou to another. And the doctrine of these maxims is this. Bless them that curse you and pray for your enemies. Fast on behalf of those that persecute you. For, for what thank is there if you love them that love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You see how they're kind of paraphrasing the New Testament. But do you, uh, but do you love them that hate you? And you will not have an enemy. Abstain from fleshly and worldly lusts. If anyone give thee a blow on the right cheek, turn unto him the other also. That's in the Bible. And thou should be perfect. If one compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. If any man take away thy cloak, give him thy coat also. If a man take from thee what is thine, ask not for it again, for neither thou art able to do so. So you can see they're teaching somebody this. This is like almost a statement of faith. But this is more so of a summary. I wouldn't say this is a statement of faith. They're more so giving instruction to somebody, okay? It's a very interesting text. Um, so you can see they're pretty much paraphrasing lots of things out of the gospel. Um, you know, uh, and basically summarizing it for instruction. But, but the second commandment of the teaching is this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not corrupt youth, thou shalt not commit a fornication, so forth and so on. So they're basically, you know, kind of summing up everything. So what we want to get to is, I believe it's 15, and I already have it here. Chapter 15, bishops and deacons. We see them two offices again, okay? Appoint for, therefore for yourselves bishops and deacons, just like we saw in Philippians 1 and 1. Two offices, overseers and servants, ministers. Bishops and deacons, worthy of the Lord, men, meek, and not lovers of money. Did not what we read earlier, verse 73? And truthful and proved. So again, they had to be proved. They were telling the same thing. Like, we got to prove them out first. We got to make sure they have a report. For they also render to you the service of prophets and teachers. Now, we talked about that. You can be an elder that prophesies. You can be an overseer that teaches. You can be an overseer that also apostles. We talked about that. Even in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, chapter 5, Peter said, I exhort the elders among you, and I am also an elder. Okay, so he was an apostle and he was an elder because apostling is a calling. It's a gifting. But when he's, but when he's sitting in his assembly or when he's at home, he's an overseer of that assembly. Okay? we got to make sure we understand the difference because, again, we're going to keep seeing throughout historical writings that they had two offices, bishops and deacons. So, therefore, he said, do not despise them, for they are your honor, ones your leaders, together with the prophets and teachers. So you can see that you could have overseers, and then you could also have people that prophesied and teach, but they weren't in leadership position, just like we see today, okay? So this is a very important writing because we're going to look at a couple things here. Bishops in plural, deacons in plural, they and ones. So we can see it's always plural. Then say obey that man that's over you. It said obey them. Okay? For they are your honor warrants together with the prophets and teachers. Okay? So we're not going to remember, read all this. But again, this is one writing proving that bishops and deacons was the two offices and they were a group of people that did that work. First Clement. Now... 
There's another writing called First Clement. Most attributed the writing to Clement of Rome, somewhere between 88 and 99 AD. He was an overseer there. Now, it's speculative whether he actually wrote this because when we write, when we open up the letter, it's not saying he wrote it. So, the Catholics would make it say he wrote it. Okay. So I'm just reading it that because that's what it's called. But. He, you know, it's speculative whether or not he actually wrote it, but we do know it's a real work that was written from the church in um, Rome to the church in Corinth. And I did want to read something first. Let's go to First uh, Corinthians chapter one because we need to set the background for why what he wrote is so important. Okay, so let's go to First Corinthians chapter one. And let's look at, yeah, we can turn the light on too, sir. <laughs> All right, let's start at chapter 10, I mean verse 10 rather. And somebody can read that for me. Now I beseech you, brother, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye shall speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Uh -huh. that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So this is a letter Paul is writing to the congregation in Corinth. So why it's called Corinthians, okay, it's to that assembly. So this is what he heard. He said there'd be no divisions of money because he's heard, he's heard something. This is why he's writing the letter. He's not making, he's not just writing randomly. He heard what was going on and he's sending a letter in response to what he's heard. Okay, that's what the letter is about. Okay, what did he say? Verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brother, by the which, I mean, by them which are of the house of Florida, that there are contentions among them. So he's what he heard. He's been declared unto me. Somebody told me what's going on over at Clothes House. <laughs> All right? <laughs> there are contentions going on over there. They were meeting at people's house. Okay? Verse uh, 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am, I mean, I am of Paulus, and I am of Seed, and I am Christ. So basically, they were dividing themselves into factions, almost like denominations, right. saying, I follow Paul, well, I follow Apollos, well, I follow Peter or Cephas. You see what I'm saying? They were, they were basically making, they were glorying in men. They were making one man, esteeming one higher than the other, and saying, this is who I'm of. See what I'm saying? Kind of like we do today. Okay? So this is going on all the way back then in that time. Okay? And what did he say to this? Was Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh-huh. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Christmas and gay. Uh-huh. At least any should say that I have baptized in my own name. Baptized also the house of Uh-huh. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Okay. Now let's go to first Corinthians chapter three because he's gonna continue talking about this. What's going on? They're dividing, they're dividing the factions. Um, they want to follow particular men, they want to act like one is better than the other. And then let's skip over to first Corinthians chapter three. We're gonna skip past some information, but we're gonna keep going. Uh, and let's start as start at verse three. <clears throat> For ye are yet carnal. <laughs> For where there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Uh huh. Self explanatory. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollo, are ye not carnal? So he's saying that's carnal. Okay? Keep going. Verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollo? For men by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Uh -huh. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Verse 9. For we are laborers together. For we are laborers together. Yeah. He said, I don't glory in one. He said, okay, I plant to see Apollos water. God got the increase. That's how you're supposed to look at it, because we're all brothers. That's what Christ said. 
He said, don't even call no man your own on the earth, master or lord or rabbi. He said, for all our brothers, he wants us to work together. He wants to have a humble mind, humble spirit. And we see Paul echoing the same thing in the gospel that he heard in the gospel. He said, he said we're co-laborers together. We're God's husbandry, and you are God's building. Now, skip down to uh, verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. So don't glory in men. Mm -hmm. All things are yours. They all belong to you. They all belong to Christ. Verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Uh-huh. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God. That's how it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to glory in men. He said not to esteem another one more highly than the all. Okay, we're supposed to work together. We're supposed to be humble. Paul said in Ephesians 20, Ephesians, not Ephesians 20. And Ephesians said to endeavor to keep the unity of, of faith amongst the brothers as well. I was telling my brothers earlier, it's easy to say, okay, you don't agree? All right, cool, see ya, you know. It's easy to divide. It's easy to go start your own thing. But it's more hard to endeavor to keep unity and work together and not go off and start a faction, okay? So he's saying here, let no man glory in men for all things are yours, okay? So the reason I wanted to read this, and you can feel like, is because this is an issue at Corinth, okay? This is going on during the time of Paul. Now, if we get to this letter from so-called Clement, <laughs> He wrote a letter from Rome to the congregation in Corinth. And it's interesting what was going on. He says the letter was written by this because of a dispute in Corinth, which had led to the removal of, from office of several presbyters. Now, we read earlier, a couple of weeks ago uh, in class, that presbyter is, is a synonymous word for elder. Okay? So it's presbyter, elder, presbytery, episcopal, bishop, they're all synonymous terms. So since none of the presbyters were charged with moral offenses, this letter charges that their removal was high-handed and unjustifiable. So basically what happened was these people in Rome heard about what happened in Corinth. It's like, y'all wrong. Okay, y'all need to correct this. And guess what? We're going to send some people down from our congregation to come down here and help y'all get this sorted out. Okay? So this is what this letter is about. The only reason we're reading this letter is to show you again that they had plurality eldership and that... Um, they were following the original system that was set up by the apostles. Okay, so this is the opening of the letter, the Church of God, which sojourneth at Rome, to the Church of God, which sojourneth at Corinth. Okay, so I wrote that in yellow just to show you, again, confirming that this letter is from Rome to the congregation in Corinth. Now, this is a real letter. This is not a serious letter. We know this one's real. Now, Second Clement, that's a whole different story. They believe that's fake. This is a legit letter, okay? First Clement 21 to 6, let us have respect to our Lord Jesus whose blood was given for us. Let us reverence them that are over us. Let us honor our elders. Let us, let us instruct the young in the discipline and fear of the Lord. Let us direct our wives to that which is good. So again, he's speaking in plural. Okay, he's never saying there's one person. It's that group again. Amen? 42 and 4, I'm skipping down, so you just got to kind of go with me. Preaching, therefore, throughout the centuries and cities, they appointed their first fruits to be bishops and deacons. So again, he's confirming what we've already read in Philippians 1 and 1. They had two offices. He's talking here about the apostles. They said they appointed their first fruits of the first leaders to be bishops and deacons, such as should believe after they had proved them in the spirit. We keep saying that word proved again. Okay? So we're seeing a congruency of the word and what they were practicing at that time. 44 and 1, our apostles too, by the instruction of our Lord Jesus, knew that strife would arise concerning the dignity of a bishop. So they had four dollars. They knew people was going to act crazy about leading the church. They knew there was going to be strife. That's what he's saying here. So this is what he said. And on this account, having received perfect foreknowledge, he's talking about the apostles, he says, they appointed the above mentioned as bishops and deacons, and then gave a rule of succession in order that when they had fallen asleep, other men who had been approved might succeed to their ministry. So again, if you set up a group of overseers and then you die, but you told them, this is what you do, this is the qualifications for the next leaders, this is the callings you're looking for, this is how it works, when you're dead and gone, they can keep bringing in new, new leaders. It's simple. It's a simple system. You got a group, 
Then you got more people coming in, getting saved. They may serve as deacons first, because we're going to see that usually what happened was they served as deacons, kind of like we do in church today. You serve, start out by serving, and then you may go into an office of leading. Okay? They were doing the same thing, and it was supposed to just keep going. Amen? As long as we follow the word, as long as we follow the qualifications we stay set up, it should be on fire. Okay? 44 and 3, those who were thus appointed by them or afterwards by other men of good repute with the consent of the whole church. So here he's saying even the church had the consent to you being a leader. Okay? Again, because if we're proving you, the church can say, yes, this person has served. Yes, they didn't steal. Yes, they don't sleep around. Yes, they, they are a good person. We can vouch for them. Okay? It wasn't just like uh, some people teach where it's... it's the, the head's laying hands on somebody. He's the one doing it. No, that's not how they did it. Okay, because that's not even scriptural. Again, we have qualifications. And again, we're seeing you have to be qualified. And there was a consent that came along with that. All right? So here in verse 44, he says, For it will be no small sin to us if we dispose for the office of bishop those, again, it's in plural, who blamelessly and have made the offering. Okay, so he's writing to a church and he says those. So again, we see again, this is in plural. There's a group of men there that are leading. Verse 5, happy are the presbyters. See how they just went to presbyters and started using the word interchangeably. Okay, happy are they who have finished their course before God and died in mature age after they have more fruit. But they do not fear lest anyone should remove them from the place appointed them. So I just put a note here saying presbyter is used interchangeably. He's still talking about overseers and bishops. This is funny because we read a couple of weeks ago, Paul did the same thing. Okay? In Acts chapter 20, he said he went to Miletus. And he said he called for the elders of the church. That's what it said. Elders was in plural. And then in verse 17, I believe, not 17, down verse 26, 27, he said, he said, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Okay, so he used the word overseer there, which was bishops. Okay, so we see them using these words interchangeably. So we see even again, in the first century, they did that. And this last one, verse 6, for we see that you have removed some men of honest conversation from the ministry, which have been blamelessly and honorably performed by them. So again, he's saying here, y'all don't kick some people out that were leading, and you should have kicked them out. Okay? He was hearing about the strife, and he challenged them on that. All right? So, Didache, bishops and deacons, we see the same thing. Other letter, first century, we see the same thing written there. Polycarp. Anybody know who that was? I'm going to take a break. I'm talking a lot. I'm talking fast. Am I going too fast? Okay, I want to make sure. I'm telling you, some of this stuff is very important because these are people who died for the faith. Okay? These are people who died for this because they were being persecuted literally for about 300 years. So these are people who went out before us and were dying for this word because Christianity and the faith of Christ was not a legal religion in Rome until 313 A.D. Okay, so that's almost 280 years after the time of Christ. Okay, yes, Brian. So that's Paul's death, correct? Yes. Yes. He shows up in uh, Fox's book, The Martyrs. That's why. Yeah, Polycarp. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, that's right, right, right. This is a legit person. He did exist. So he, he lived from around 69 AD to 155 AD. So this is first into the second century. He was a second century overseer in Smyrna. Okay, so he was one of the overseers in there. He died a martyr, bound and burned at the stake, and they stabbed him after they burned him. <laughs> they wanted to make sure. They, yeah, they wanted to make sure he was really dead. Okay? The reason they stabbed him, they say he was in the fire, and they would say a lot of people say he wasn't dying. Now, you know, whether that's true or whether that's a myth, we don't know. But apparently they burned him, and then they stabbed him. Okay, because they were persecuting believers. They were feeding them the lions. They were setting them on fire when they were having a festival. Okay? Yeah. And it became so bad, believers were like, well, you know what? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's how they used to think. So they were, they were ready. They believed in this thing. Amen? We got to have that mindset, I'm telling y'all. <laughs> so it is recorded by Irenaeus, who heard him speak in his youth. So Irenaeus was another guy who wrote that he heard Polycarp speak when he was younger, and by another guy named Tertullian, we're going to see these guys later on, that Polycarp had been a disciple of, the, of John the Apostle, okay? 
So there's other people that say, yes, he followed John. John was one of his people that preached to him, and he was a disciple of John the Apostle. And this has been proven, and this is legit. So what did he write? He wrote one letter. He wrote a letter to the people in Philippians from Smyrna. And look at what he wrote. He said, Polycarp and the elders with him. He didn't say Polycarp the bishop with the elders with him. No. Polycarp and the elders with him. They were running this in a group. Okay? To the church of God sojourning at Philippi, mercy to you and peace from God Almighty, from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. See how they write all like Paul and like John? They were so influenced by their leaders that went before them that they even wrote the way they do. It's the same way today. We preach like the people we heard preach. You know, we pray like they pray. You know, they hoop, we hoop. You know, <laughs> you know, if they dance a certain way, we dance with it. It's the same thing. They were doing that. Somebody got that? Oh, that's oh, I thought, okay. So <laughs> let the presbyters be compassionate and merciful to all, bringing back those that wander, visiting all the sick, not neglecting the widow, the orphan, and the poor. Presbyters, see how you use that word interchangeably? Again, so we're seeing them use the same word. Again, next verse, wherefore it is right to abstain from all these things, submitting yourselves to the presbyters and deacons. So he didn't say bishops and deacons, he said presbyters and deacons. But again, the word is interchangeable. It means elders. Okay? So we see the same two offices. We always see them referring to the leaders in plural. He was writing to one church. He wasn't writing to whatever. This is how he wrote. Okay? Now, the question then becomes, if they were following it a certain way, then who changed it? How did things change from that? How did we get to where we are today where we think the norm is to have one person do this and this is their job? Okay? Because again, it's more fruitful to do it the scriptural way and the way the apostles set up. Because like we just read, Clement said, they had four hours about this. He said they knew there was going to be strife, so he said, I'm, we're going to put a group of people in place so they can do this work. Okay? So, I told y'all last week that you know, I get to travel a lot for my job, and I go to Montreal sometimes, and um, when I go to Montreal, there's a school there called McGill University, and McGill University has a really, really great religious studies program there as a major. So when I go to their library, their library is just awesome. And if you go to the top floor, the top floor of the library is nothing but religious books. And they have a ridiculous spread of books from first century all the way up until now. Like, they have the complete works of some of these. This stuff we never even heard of. Some of the books are in Latin. Some of the books are in French. Some of them are in the Coptic. You know, and it's just amazing when you go in this library because there's so much information and stuff that's been preserved in these writings that I believe, you know, uh, is very valuable if we extract the right information. So I'm walking in this library one day. And I'm like, okay, God, there's all these books in here. What do you want me to, what you want me to read in here? Because this is a, I got to take advantage. My, I'm not going here to read the Bible. I got to read something in here because I'm here. He said, Jerome. I heard it just like that, Jerome. I said, okay. And I, I knew who Jerome was. And Jerome lived from around uh, March 347 to September 420. He was an elder, a confessor, a theologian, and a historian. Okay? He's best known for his translation of most of the Bible into Latin. Okay, so this is real early, okay, because the Bible, remember, a lot of the New Testament was written in Greek, okay, so kind of take a step forward in Rome, you had basically it wasn't all, it was all Rome, but they divided it east and west, okay, and on the west side of Rome, it was a lot of Latin speakers, okay, and on the east side, it was mostly Greek, okay, so Jerome translated the Greek letters and a lot of the New Testament into Latin, okay? So he's best known for doing that, and that translation became known as the Latin Vulgate, okay? And he also had commentaries that he wrote on the Gospels, okay? And one of the things we're going to see is one of the commentaries that he wrote about plurality eldership is going to be very interesting what he wrote, okay? I just put a little letter here to show you, LXX Septuagint. So that was what we started with. That is what the Old Testament is uh, written in. It's called Septuagint, which simply means 70. Yes, book of 70. Book of 70. So basically, when Ptolemy, Prince Ptolemy, sometime between Malachi and Matthew, he wanted um, the Old Testament, he wanted the Jewish Hebrew word converted into Greek. Okay? So the LXX is the Septuagint. He got 70 Jewish people, Jewish elders, scribes. The legend says he put them all in a different room. 
He made them all translated. And then he compared all 70 copies to come away with the best translation that he could. That's pretty smart. <laughs> so that's why it's called the LXX, the 70, the Septuagint. Okay. So we have the New Testament in Greek. He converted, you know, Jerome wrote, converted Greek New Testament into Latin. He also converted the Septuagint, the Old Testament, the Hebrew, mm -hmm. into Latin. Okay, so basically we have Latin Septuagint. There was another, there was a bunch of other versions of Latin floating around, but apparently they weren't that great. So he basically compiled that and he come at, come up with the Latin Vulgate. The reason this is important because the Latin Vulgate to this day is still the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church to this day. They don't have an English official version. They still believe in Jerome's translation, okay? Which is interesting because it was only one guy. So a lot is, because when I was walking in the library, I was like, okay, Jerome, there's a lot hinging on him. You got a whole multi-million dollar organization who's literally, their Bible rests on Jerome. His translation. Okay? That's, you got to think about that. <laughs> All right? So, it says, study Jerome. I said, okay. Some of Jerome's translations were used in the KJV. As the KJV was translated from the text receptus, which simply is Greek for received text, okay, with help from the Latin Vulgate. So they did use the Latin Vulgate with some of the translation into the KJV. Okay, you can look that up. I'm not going to go through that. Um, so again, this is, seems like a very important guy, doesn't it? Now, to give John, Jerome some credit, I actually studied him a little bit. He is was actually really a man person. Like, when he went and studied the last Septuagint, he went and sat with Hebrew people, okay? He went and studied with them. And it's so funny because out of all his study and all his, you know, understanding, eventually he ends up as a monk. He's like, he ends up, <laughs> ends up kind of leaving the institutional thing and kind of saying, okay, because I've studied, I get it. I see what's going on here. And I don't want to get deep into that. But he really, really, this guy really studied. He was really a theologian. He was really a scholar. Okay, uh, and I, it was very just um, amazing just to kind of see some of the things he did, especially when you talk about you translated the whole Bible in the Latin. I mean, come on, you gotta be, you gotta be scholarly to do that. Amen. Yeah. All right. So what did Jerome say? So in Titus one and five, we read this scripture before. It says, "For this cause I left the increase that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee." So. Paul told Titus he should go and set and ordain overseers, elders in every city as he had appointed them. Okay? A group. This is what Paul told Titus to do. Now, this is what Jerome commentated on this verse. You know, in a commentary, you've got the verse, and you have a commentary next to it. So when you want to see a little bit into the verse, you see what someone wrote about it. Okay? So this is what he said. He said before factions or divisions sprung up in the Christian administration before such expressions as these uttered amongst the faithful, I belong to Paul, I Apollos, I Cephas, we read that earlier. He said before all that happened, he said the churches were governed by a common council of their presbyters. But when it came to pass that each individual presbyter looked on those whom he had baptized to be an acquisition for himself, not for Christ, everywhere it was decided that one presbyter should be chosen and placed over the others. And that to him the care of the church at large should appertain, thereby to remove every principle of schism. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> now, what's funny about it is... It's not amazing. Right, right. <laughs> this is their guy. Jerome is the Roman Catholic's dude. This is their guy. This is the guy that translated their Latin version. He's saying this. He's saying, look, it keeps getting better. Look, it gets better. These instances I have brought to show that presbyters and bishops were, for those of old, one of the same. Isn't that what I said? Mm -hmm. But that by decrees... The government was restricted to one. Now, who makes decrees? Popes. They change stuff. Development of doctrine, right? So we talked about. The government was restricted to one in order to do away with the possibility of dissensions in future. As therefore, presbyters should know, I'm down here, that in virtue of church usage, they are submitted to their prelate. Wow. 
whoever he may be. <laughs> so let bishops understand that they themselves are greater than presbyters. More from a usage than from the primary ordinance from the Redeemer. And it is their duty to govern the churches by joint deliberation. Okay? Wow. wow. Oh, he keeps going. Jerome, he laid it out. He didn't care. <laughs> you know, he didn't care. So we we'll keep going. If someone thinks that this is our opinion, but not that of the scripture, that bishop and priest or presbyter are one, basically the same thing, and that one is a type of age and the other of duty, let him reread the apostle's words to the Philippians when he says, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace and peace to you, and so on. Then we read that. So he even goes to Philippians 1 and 1 and say, I'm first, look, it's in the words right there, Philippians 1 and 1. Two offices, bishop and deacon. He's saying it's the same thing, okay? And what does he say next? He says, Philippi is a single city in Macedonia, and at least one city, several were, several were not to be bishops as now thought, but at that time they called the same men bishops who they also called priests or presbyters. Okay, so he says it was the same word. They use it interchangeably is what he's saying. All right. These things have been said in order to show that the men of old, the same men who were priests, were also called bishops. But gradually, as the seedbeds of dissensions were eradicated, all solicitude was conferred to one man. Therefore, just as priests know that by custom of the church, they are subject to the one who was previously appointed over them. That's Catholic. Okay? They got one appointed, and then they next one appoint another one. They only appoint one, though. So you got to submit to that one. That's how they do it. So he said here, by custom of the church, they are subject to the one who was previously appointed over them. So let bishops know that they, more by custom than truth of the Lord's arrangement, are greater than priests, presbyters. And they ought to rule the church commonly in imitation of Moses, when he had under his authority to preside alone over the people of Israel, he chose the 70 elders who could judge the people. So this is what Jerome said happened. So he recognizes and says, we had plurality eldership, we had a group of overseers, we changed it. Okay? Anybody, everybody hear that? Okay? So we got it right here. Jerome clearly lays it out because again, like I told you, the methodology for that is we're going to look in the Bible, see what the Bible says. We're going to look at the history, which we just did. Looked at the Dache, looked at the Clement, looked at the Polycarp. We saw they were doing it. And then here we see when they changed it. So the question then is, <laughs> so Jerome said it was decreed and changed. Well, who changed it? <laughs>